a college degree was in your future. Then life took a different turn. Jump back into school with confidence in a program designed for adults like you. Experience the support of a personal enrollment counselor. They'll walk with you through every step of the enrollment process. Move smoothly from one course to the next with books delivered right to you before each course. Returning to school can be seamless when you have the right support. Thrive without ceasing. Start today at adult.cornerstone.edu. In effect, the Gospels are the Gospel writers telling a story about them and Jesus. They're telling their interpret their interpretive experience of who Jesus is. And so you have from Mark, you know, this sort of immediate, very sort of teacherly Jesus um, who also, you know, heals people. And then there's the, you know, the, the passion narrative. And you get uh, Luke, you know, who's very concerned about issues of the poor and women and folks who are marginalized. You get Matthew, who's telling an experience of a very, very, very Jewish Jesus. And then you get John, the, the story of the, the sort of the, the mystical, poetic Jesus. And so, so you get these four portraits of Jesus, these four different pictures that are in the canonical Gospels, and that doesn't even count all the other ones that were running around in the ancient world, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, all those things. And so, um, but they're all accounts, they're all personal accounts of who this person, who, who this Jesus is. And it's really interesting because they all claim that personal, you know, thing is that, oh, this was written by Luke, this was written by Mark, this was written by Matthew. And so it's like the the credibility of the the whole story is based around the idea that some individual actually knew Jesus. And so it's kind of fascinating, you know, to think of these as um, memoir theology. That's what the Gospels are, memoir theology. And so if you go to them, this idea of Savior is not really present, um, you get talk of Christ being the anointed one, or you get the idea, which is not quite Savior, that's the Messiah. And so you get this idea of Jesus being the the Messiah. And what's fascinating about that is, at least in a couple places, uh, Jesus, like the Gospel of Mark, Jesus doesn't want anybody to know. (laughs) So he says, (laughs) Don't call me that. So we have this thing in the Gospels called the Messianic secret. Mm. And so, so you know, don't use that. Don't use that word in public. Don't that, don't don't call me that. And so, even though there is this sort of open secret about the, be, Jesus being the Anointed One, um, the language of Savior doesn't show up in that transactional die for our sins kind of way uh, that will become part of the narrative that Paul tells later on. Her face must look like you. A face like a Tina and I'm Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I am your host, John Williamson. This week, we have a popular returning guest, but before I get to that, uh, a few items of note. Uh, If you're new to the podcast, thank you for listening. Welcome. Uh, Check out our website, www.thedeconstructionist.com, to listen to our entire back catalog of episodes going back almost six years now. Uh, Link to us on social media, read our blog, snag a t-shirt or a pint glass from our web store, or support us if you'd like by joining our Patreon family. This episode was written, edited, and produced by myself, John Williamson, and the theme music is brought to you by Forrest Clay, so you uh, will have heard the songs Recover and Does God uh, by Clay. So, uh, without further ado, though, let's get to this week's guest. So, again, this is a uh, popular guest that we've had on several times before. In fact, she might be uh, the record holder for a uh, guest who's been on the podcast the, the most. So, uh, this week, I welcome Diana Butler Bass. We talk all about her new book, Freeing Jesus, Rediscovering Jesus as Friend, Teacher, 
Savior, Lord, Way, and Presence. Uh, you may remember her from some of her best-selling work, uh, like the book Grounded, which is one of my personal favorites uh, of all time. So we talk all about her new book, though, and it's a, a very, very timely uh, book. I think you'll find a lot of the topics are, are very, very relevant based on what we are all experiencing uh, currently. So without further ado, I give you Diana Butler Bass. Welcome back to the Deconstructionist Podcast. This is, I believe, your third time we've had you on. So you're in you're in a small club of people. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't believe that. Time flies when you're having fun, huh? Absolutely. Somebody told me the other day. They said, "Congratulations on your five year anniversary of doing the podcast." And I thought, "Really? <laughs> it seems like we just started." But you know. Um, Anyway, you have a, the fact that you've got uh, now a third book out that we're, we're here to talk about. Um, we were just talking about this before we, before we sat down to record. I love it because not only does it talk about Jesus, uh, which in and of itself is a great topic, but it also has a ton of really awesome history in it as well. So what, what prompted you to, to write this book? And by the way, it's called Freeing Jesus. So what, what was the prompting for, for this particular subject? Well, you know, I didn't really plan on writing a book about Jesus. Um, I was thinking about writing a much more generalized book about belief. And the first kind of draft that I had for what becomes Freeing Jesus was a book called Something to the Effect of an Unsystematic Theology. And um, I was going to go through and look at different aspects of theology kind of in a a handbook style. And it was, the intention was to keep theological themes and conversation going, even among people who were leaving church. So that was the first kind of draft of the book. And what happened was I sat down the summer of 2019 to write this, you know, unsystematic theology handbook. And I thought, where am I going to start? And I and I thought, oh, I'm going to start with a chapter on Jesus, just because it seemed easy. <laughs> so I sat at my computer, started to write, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote. I think I got somewhere up to, I know I got over 60 pages, 70, 80 pages, someplace in there. And I thought to myself, uh-oh, I'm not writing a book about theology across the board. I'm writing a book about Jesus. And so it was really kind of an accidental project where Jesus took over my theology book and insisted that I write an entire book just about one topic, and that is Jesus. That's amazing. And I love how you recount the story at the very, very beginning where you're standing in, I believe it was a, a cathedral in Washington, and uh, Jesus really spoke to you in that moment and said what I think a lot of us have been kind of feeling, especially over the last uh, handful of years, uh, and that is let me out. And so talk about that and how that kind of had an influence, because at the beginning of the book, you really talk about uh, kind of this forgotten aspect of Jesus, and that's the Jesus of experience. The the book, when I realized I was writing a book about Jesus, I knew that I wanted to share this episode that happened in 2013. And so, obviously, it happened a long time ago, but I had sort of kept it to myself, and I had never put it in print. I'd, I'd use it in a couple of sermons. But I had gone to the National Cathedral, and I was praying, and I was in this beautiful chapel, side chapel in the cathedral, And um, the side chapel has this glorious painting of uh, Jesus. It's uh, from the early 20th century. It's it's blue and gold, and it's 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 just magnificent. It's one of my favorite paintings in the cathedral. And uh, so I'm I'm kneeling 
before this altar with the painting above it. And I, God, where are you? I really need to, I really need to have a sense of your presence. And I I had a bunch of questions uh, about some things related to vocation and other things. And God had seemed strangely quiet and strangely absent from my life for a while. So there I was, you know, sort of struggling at this altar when all of a sudden I heard these words, get me out of here. And it was so clear that I thought that there was somebody behind me. So I I turned around and uh, lo and behold, I was completely alone um, in the, in the chapel. And I, I kind of looked up and I went, Jesus. And and I heard it a second time, get me out of here. And I went, is that you? (laughs) So, (laughs) and of course, because, uh, this is the way things happen in these kinds of visions. Then the voice came a third time and said, get me out of here. And by that point, I was so freaked out that I literally ran out of the cathedral. And I, I, I you know, I was, I was hearing voices. And I went, got home and I told my husband the story. And he just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and he, he refers to it as that time that Jesus... Jesus asked you to spring him from the slammer. <laughs> and, and so that has been for our family, um, you know, kind of a joke uh, all these years. It's like, uh-oh, better not go to the National Cathedral. Jesus is going to ask mom to <laughs> smuggle him out in her purse again, you know. And so, <laughs> so um, it was a pretty powerful moment. And I, I spent a lot of time in the last, you know, eight years um, reflecting on that and what would that mean? But, you know, it, it, it does, I think, speak to the moment we're in, you know, as so many people now are attempting to free their own lives, as it were, um, from institutional sorts of accretions of what it means to be Christian and kind of run out into the world with Jesus. And so that becomes the, the frame for the rest of the story that I tell. Get yeah. me out of here. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It does seem so timely because there there seem to be, I mean, a, a lot of examples in recent years where Jesus in name has been used to justify all sorts of things that Jesus himself would be opposed to, I think. Yeah, well, today, you know, we're, we're, we're taping before everybody will hear this, and it's uh, basically the, the three-month anniversary of of the insurrection at the Washington Capitol. You know, so I live in D.C., so I pay attention to lots of stuff going on in the town. But, you know, that was a big, huge thing that happened to all of us. And the the sign that will never flee from my mind is, is uh, the sign where one of these people who was attacking the Capitol uh, had held up in the foreground. And, you know, there's... There's all kinds of mayhem happening in the photograph, but the sign says, Jesus saves. And so, Hmm. I mean, that is such an example of the kind of thing that's going on in our culture right now, is that the name of Jesus is being taken into places and and used to back up um, all sorts of actions that there's no way that Jesus would ever condone. And so... To be able to kind of to free be able to free Jesus right now is really important because it's all these fa- false notions. You know, the cathedral notion of Jesus may not ultimately be quite as harmful as what's happening there at the at the insurrection on January sixth. But in both circumstances, whether it's um, a, a church tradition that's sort of stuck and doesn't give people the freedom of using their own experience, their imaginations to understand what it really means to encounter Jesus, or if it is the people who have basically co-opted Jesus for various kinds of political social movements that are fundamentally opposed to the teachings of loving your neighbor or the teachings of nonviolence, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, Jesus needs to be freed from a whole bunch of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things you talk about early in the book too is uh, you have this quote that I love uh, where you say, uh, the real problem is thinking that belief is an exam, that there are right or wrong answers, this very dualistic notion uh, of God, of Jesus. Um, And and you point out after that, that Paul, you know, who wrote 
a large portion of the New Testament, became a follower of Jesus before creeds were even a thing. Yeah, I I sort of came to like Paul again a lot, actually, in uh, doing this project, because Paul is at base an experiential thinker. Um, his whole sense of who Jesus is arises out of the encounter that he has with this with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And so here we have this 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 very zealous fellow who hates people who are following Jesus and he's persecuting them and he's trying to you know get the goods on them by following some some people he knows to be Christians into Damascus and he's going to have them arrested and you know probably killed and it, he's on that road to doing this awful deed and Jesus appears to him And what I think is fascinating about that story is we're told it in several different ways in the New Testament, both in the book of Acts, and then also Paul does recount it variously in his own writings, is that, um, you know, Jesus shows up and it's like blinding light and Paul falls on the ground. And the question that Paul asks is not, uh, what's happened to me or, um, how 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 am I ever going to get out of this moment? You know, uh, uh, what's going on here? He he says literally, "Who are you? Who are you, Lord?" And that question, I think, if you if you take Paul's experience and then plop that question around the epistles, and here I'm talking about the epistles that are authentically Paul, you know, Romans, the Corinthian ones, Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, Philippians, Um, and you look at the authentic Paul writings, you can see how Paul is wrestling in some way, shape, or form with that question in every epistle, even when he's addressing these very uh, misbehaving uh, young churches that he planted. He's constantly going back to that experience, and he's constantly sort of working out of that question, who are you? Who are you, Jesus? And um, I I think it's fascinating, and I don't think I ever really knew until I was working on this book that Paul doesn't come up with a single answer to that question. Um, Throughout those, you know, authentic epistles, um, Paul comes up with eight, ten, maybe twelve uh, different really prominent images for Jesus that run everything from fairly standard ones that you might think of, like Savior, um, or uh, to, you know, cosmic Christ, or mystical vision, a compassionate one. I mean, it, Paul really has a poetic uh, sort of range of uh, ways that he understands uh, who who Jesus is, and that his theology emerges out of that constant re-engagement of that question, who are you, Jesus? And so, I I think that for the purposes of this project, and also really my own spiritual life, to re-embrace that experiential Paul, that questioning Paul, um, who never really is satisfied with a single answer that he comes up with um, about who Jesus is, but he lets himself explore that question constantly throughout his whole life. And um, I I think that that becomes a model. It certainly was a model for how I approached this project. But I I think it's a model that we've neglected um, oftentimes in churches. Instead, we say, oh, Paul said X. Well, actually, Paul said X, Y, Z, P, Q, M, N, uh, A, and and B, too. And, And so... If Paul can have that kind of complexity in theology and understanding who Jesus is, certainly we we need to as well. Yeah, and and I love the way, speaking of which, I love the way that you've organized the book um, by chapter. You know, you talk about all these different almost faces of Jesus that we see. Jesus as friend, Jesus as teacher, Savior, Lord, way, presence. Um, And it's so cool how, how you kind of break that down. And uh, I love the fact that you start with friend because you talk about the fact that friend, you know, when we say someone is a friend, it's almost kind of looked at in this juvenile kind of sense, but, but really it's much more intimate 
than that, right? Like you talk about the fact that, you know, um, it shows up all over scripture and, and friend, when I think of it as someone that you can, you can trust someone you can confide in someone who sees all sides of you without, you know, fear of judgment. So talk, talk about that a little bit. Well, the book is arranged chronologically, um, in terms of my own life. And, uh, one of the mechanisms that I used to write it was to literally sit in my office and ask myself the question over the course of the, the beginning part of, of putting the book together. How did I think about Jesus What are my, when I was le- younger than five years old? And then the next question I'd say, how did I think about Jesus when I was in elementary school? And how did I think about Jesus when I was an adolescent? So I went through my life chronologically, and I tried to draw out in every one of those stages, um, at least uh, three or four uh, really dominant memories, thing, ways that I thought about Jesus when I was that particular age. I was, I was surprised at how much I could recover um, about knowing Jesus when I was younger than five. It, it really uh, sort of startled me that there was so much left in my my memory and my heart about my right. earliest childhood. And so the the image that drew me into the friendship piece was sitting in a Methodist Sunday school classroom when I was teeny tiny, three or four years old. And my favorite uh, Sunday school teacher, Miss Jean, who I still remember exactly what she looks like, um, was telling us a story about Jesus welcoming little children. And as she told the story, she also held, held up this, this picture, and it was a picture of Jesus, and it's, Jesus was surrounded by all these little kids who were very close to him. And one of the children uh, was a little girl who had blonde hair and blue eyes just like all little girls did 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel. <laughs> and uh, she was, uh, and I looked at her and I thought, oh my gosh, that's me. <laughs> that's a picture of me. And um, I got so excited, you know, because there I was. And this little girl, she was the closest to Jesus. And she had her head on Jesus' shoulder. And I, I mean, it, it it does a couple of things for me. One is it speaks to the power of representation. You know, when we see ourselves in a picture, you know, with God or with Jesus, or I suppose with Moses or Muhammad, you know, if we, we see ourselves in the picture, somehow it becomes an opening for us. And so I saw myself represented in that picture. I saw me. And, um, you know, the second thing I saw, of course, was a little girl who was friends someone who Jesus reached out to, and they were close. They were friends. And so that becomes the, the, the origin memory of that, that chapter, sitting in that, that Sunday school classroom in a circle. So the book proceeds in each chapter in a very similar way. You're starting out with a memory that really frames up a particular part of my life, and so here we are with the with the friend image. And for some of the chapter, I try to speak, no matter if I'm speaking as I'm four or eight or thirteen. I try to develop a a voice, a literary voice, that is as if I was still that age. So when you're reading the friendship chapter, you're reading me as a as a writer talking about something as close as I can possibly write it as if I was four years old. And so, you know, there's all kinds of stories in that chapter about Jesus and my Barbie dolls, and there's Jesus and me in the woods together. And there's, so, so there's, there's a several beautiful images um, of, of childhood friendship. And that of course gets to your question that we often think of child. We also often think of friendship as being really juvenile. It, we, we, we don't know what to do with friendship as adults. We like our friends. We love our friends. But really, in the 21st century, we're often way too busy for our friends, which is very sad. And um, the number of people who most American adults have as a close friend, as close friends, has gone down um, throughout the course of the last uh, 30 years. Uh, 
about 30 years ago, most uh, American adults had three to four friends, uh, close, intimate friends. And uh, the last sort of psychological study, the last sociological data we have on that is that most American adults now have two. Wow. Yeah. So while we treasure friendship, it's becoming a sort of a lost practice. And so, so, so I learned a lot about friendship in that chapter, um, kind of what our problems are around friendship. And the sad fact that Christian, I mean, I've often heard in sermons, people belittle uh, friendship. You know, oh, Jesus isn't your friend. That's not reverent enough. Jesus is your, your Lord, you know, and yet the theological narratives, and that's when I move out of the childhood voice into the adult voice. And so the, the theological narratives of both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, there's a rich tradition of friendship with God throughout the whole Bible. And I, d- I did not really know that until I worked on this book. I mean, I had vague sense of it, you know, that God called Moses uh, a friend. And uh, certainly Jesus turns around and says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but I call you my friends. So I knew that. Um, But to think of it as a major thread of God's longing for humankind is that God actually wants to be our friends or wants to be our friend. And that that is an important part of the whole story um, that runs through the the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. So it's a it's a beautiful thing, and I I loved writing about friendship. And it's it's amazing to me, although it is at the beginning of the book. So maybe people who have been interviewing me have only read the first chapter. <laughs> but I I'm not, I don't I know that's not your case. But um, you know I I people must be very hungry for this because some interviewers have spent almost the entire time interviewing me about friendship, God, friendship, Jesus, and, and sort of ideals about friendship and why we've lost them. And and, um, it's a really important subject. Yeah. And you even, you even bring up some instances where I wasn't even aware that, that friend or friendship even shows up. Like you talk about the Lord's prayer and one of the uh, fascinating things to me, which is uh, translation issues, you know, where we have these very complex nuanced languages, Hebrew, Greek, and oftentimes there aren't like for like words in in English. And so you point out where there's some, uh, some possible references to friendship there instead of what we've kind of grown up, uh, you know, with. Yeah. That, that whole, um, at the very beginning, our father, um, you know, and nearly all Catholics refer to that prayer as the, our father, um, and Protestants call it the Lord's prayer. And so, uh, that prayer, our Father, we've been told in English that it means Father. And then, of course, if you go to seminary, you you, you learn that the word there is Abba, A-B-B-A, and that um, Jesus is talking to uh, about Father in a really intimate language. And so, it's more appropriate, perhaps, if it was translated as Daddy, you know, sort of, but, but what's fascinating is that keeps the male frame on it. And there, but there are other people who have argued that that translate, that, that word that we translate father or daddy um, actually does have very non-hierarchical connotations of friendship and that it might be equally appropriate to say our friend who art in heaven, that this opens up the possibility of of this intimate relationship that is less parental and more about trust. Um, and so we move away from hierarchy and we move towards this idea of mutuality of friendship with God. And and that is, you know, a legitimate speculation because as you say, the language is a little slippery. And certainly the word that's used there is very similar to the word that's used in um, in the Old Testament, or what we believe to be the word that was used in the Old Testament that does actually translate as fr- one of the words that translates as friend. Uh, that's so interesting. Um, 
One of the other things, uh, pieces of information that that was new to me that was uh, fascinating, I think, is when you get into the next chapter and you start talking about Jesus as teacher, and of course, like we all grew up with uh, learning the, the stories about Jesus as a child and kind of running off, um, you know, like naughty Jesus does and disappears for a few days. And uh, but he's caught with with the rabbis. He's he's having these conversations, and then of course later on in his adult life. Very clearly, he's out there teaching and preaching. But the the part that was new to me that I wasn't aware of is this title of rabbi and the history behind this term and the fact that it was relatively new at that time. And um, so I, w- I wonder if you could uh, talk about that a little bit. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's always fun when you write a book. You know, here I am, I'm writing a book it's, that I call a theological or a uh, what I call memoir theology. So the structure of it is around my own life and the primary sort of set of stories that I tell are all things that are my memories. And so you think to yourself, okay, well, that's cool. You know, memoir, what do you have to learn? Every single chapter of this book, I learned something I did not know before um, theologically. And this was the piece in the teacher chapter that uh, it kind of blew my socks off actually. (laughs) Um, I found it, it, this this reference, oddly enough, there's a, a Jewish annotated version of the New Testament. And it was uh, the primary editors of the Jewish annotated version of the New Testament are Amy Jo Levine, who I'm pretty sure most of your uh, Fantastic. Yeah. listeners will know. Oh, yes. And uh, Mark Brettler, I believe is her colleague's name. And um, so I... I hold myself accountable these days when I'm preaching that I always look at a sort of a standard, you know, Christian New Testament, New Revised Standard Version or what have you. And then I often look at this Jewish version too, because I'm trying to avoid issues around anti-Semitism. And so I was looking up references of Jesus as a teacher in the Jewish annotated New Testament. And so, <laughs> so I go over there and there's this footnote that says, um, Jesus is the earliest historically attested person to have ever been called rabbi. And I think that my eyes might have popped out of my head. <laughs> Uh, is that the historical evidence for this Jewish first century development of what becomes rabbinic Judaism, what the kind of Judaism we know today primarily in the world, um, was Jesus, and it's found in the New Testament. And so I, I literally thought, this is like one of the, the greatest sort of interreligious things ever planted in the middle of the of the Christian New Testament. So so that's true. Is that rabbinic Judaism, the idea of a rabbi was it was a new idea in the first century and Jesus was part of this emerging Jewish practice, this thing that would become Jewish tradition. And when all these people around Jesus are referring to him as teacher, teacher, rabbi, rabbi, they're picking up on what is then a very kind of new um, form of Jewish interpretation and spiritual life and these rabbis who were gaining followers and attracting disciples and people teaching in these new ways, the the traditions of Judaism. And so when they were doing, when uh, Jesus' friends do this, they're participating in what is essentially an emerging uh, form of Judaism. And, um, that's who Jesus' friends thought he was, one of these kind of emergent rabbis of the first century. Okay. And so I think that's pretty fantastic. And it's that is the term that is used most often in the Gospels to describe who Jesus is. Uh, other terms, uh, you know, friend does show up, um, Savior does show up, Lord shows up. Other words do show up, shepherd. I mean, there's all kinds of images for Jesus in the Gospels. But the word that is used most often by the people who knew Jesus best was rabbi. Hmm. It, Teacher. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that you talk about, too, that I think is so important is the way in which Jesus taught, which was he didn't, and maybe in some in some ways this would have been easier for, for us thousands of years later, but he didn't just 
give the disciples or, or the people he was preaching to the answers. He taught through parables, which is this very complex kind of storytelling method, but that was clearly intentional. And I would love for you to talk about why, why that's so important and why that's, uh, has such a different impact, I think, than just giving, just straight giving the answers. Well, I, When we think of teacher, you know, we think of somebody who is giving us a test. You know, it's a bunch of information or some instructions to memorize. And then if you get that stuff right, you're going to you're going to pass a test. And um, that's one way to think about teachers. But I think most of us all know, even just from any of our experience, that there's something that happens that's more for the teachers who have been the the greatest teachers in our lives. And that more is usually the capacity of teacher as a kind of an inviting storyteller who changes the prism of the way that we see the world. And so Jesus gave instructions, Jesus gave rules, Jesus taught commands, he gave us a whole bunch of information. But then there's this other body of stuff, and that's the parables, these these stories. And um, I, I have always loved the parables because they don't have a single meaning. They have multiple meanings. Um, I, in my own life as a Christian person, you know, I've preached tons on the parables, but I, you know, I've read them my whole life. And what is the case is if you go to the parables, honestly, you, you probably should never interpret them the same way um, twice. The parables are always open to a fresh engagement of our experience with the text. And um, it's kind of become, I think, a little bit of a uh, malpractice um, within certain kinds of circles to say that this is the interpretation of the parable. And um, I give a story about how I preached one day on the the tax collector and the Pharisee, or the yeah, the tax collector and the Pharisee. Um, they're outside the temple. They're 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 praying, and so Jesus tells a story about these t- these two men, and. Um, at the end of telling the story where the, you know, the Pharisee is very pious and the tax collector is like, oh, have mercy on me. I'm such a terrible person. Uh, forgive me, God. Um, Jesus says, which one of these two does, you know, God love, God love the best. And the way we're told the story is that, um, at least the way I was always taught the story, is that we're always supposed to say that um, the Pharisee, who is supposedly the good guy, the pious guy, um, is that... Um, you know, that person's really a hypocrite. And it's the tax collector who seems like the bad guy on the surface, but is the one who's really, you know, full of repentance and feels so sorry for all the bad things he's done, is that's, that's the one that God really loves. And that interpretation is really fraught. And so I, here I was, I was preaching in a Lutheran church, and I was in, it was actually quite beautiful. It was, it was in Idaho. And I I got up and I told the story, and uh, what I was intending to preach was that God actually loves both of them, because that's that's who God is. And um, so, it was a kind of a radical way of thinking about the parable, suggested in some senses to me by a, a, a friend who studies uh, Hebrew scripture. And so, um, so, and I liked it. It was challenging to me. It meant a lot to me. It made me think about the story differently. So, I told the story just like Jesus would have said it. And then I asked the question, who does Jesus love? And there was this little kid in the congregation who literally shouted out from the pew, Jesus loves both of them. (laughs) And I just started to laugh. And I said, why don't you come up and preach my sermon? Because that's the sermon. But it was so exciting because that little kid, it was like he got, he didn't get the answer for the test yet, you know? Yeah. And all the adults are like going, oh my gosh, you know, he said the wrong thing. And it's like, no, he said the right thing. You know, he said something that was... It was from his heart, you know, and he just, he said it because he understood. And and that's the way that the people around Jesus heard these stories. There would have been some people 
who heard that story and said, oh, well, the Pharisee, Jesus loves the Pharisee. And there would have been some there were people saying, Jesus loves the tax collector. And there would have been a whole bunch of 10-year-old kids you know, <laughs> saying, no, no, God loves everybody. And uh, <laughs> so um, that's what the parable should do. Um, actually, the whole word parable means a story that comes alongside of us and turns our world upside down. It means a story that upsets us, a story that that upends our understanding. And so that's the kind of teacher Jesus is. You have all the information, love God, love your neighbors yourself, blessed are the poor, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the information, that's the content of the teaching. But then those illustrations, you know, those stories, they cause you to encounter that teaching in ways that you don't expect. And to constantly be forced to encounter those teachings over and over again from a variety of perspectives. And that's where you come to the kind of teacher Jesus ultimately winds up being. And um, I I love the image that my uh, late friend Marcus Borg used to use, mm. uh, referring to Jesus as a wisdom teacher or a sage, S-A-G-E. And um, that's a very special kind of teacher. And, and those are the teachers who get remembered through time. Nothing is more powerful than the connection between a storyteller and their audience. Over 100 million Americans listen to podcasts every month, forming lasting connections with their favorite creators. And 56% of those listeners have purchased a product after hearing about it on a podcast. But there's an art to building meaningful relationships between consumers, hosts, and brands. Ad Results Media has it down to a science. Ad Results Media specializes in helping breakthrough brands join the conversation at scale. With over 20 years of expertise, Ad Results Media amplifies brand stories across thousands of shows, publishers, and emerging platforms. They're a data-driven matchmaker, strategically pairing world-changing brands with engaged audiences to create the sound of success. For an experienced partner to help your brand find the right audience, achieve long-term growth, and improve advertising ROI, look no further. Be part of the story. Learn more at adresultsmedia.com slash story. That's adresultsmedia.com slash story. Yeah. Oh, and, and you, and you reference Marcus Borg, one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, uh, mine too. Uh, man, if, uh, if he could see, uh, you know, I always think uh, if he could see kind of this new reformation type period that we are currently in, I think, you know, I, I think people would be b- buying his books up by the dozen at this point. Yeah, you know, I think he led us to the door of it, and then it was just time for him to to go home. Yeah. And so um, it's for the rest of us to to you know continue that kind of work. And I think that he would be, I think he would be happy with some of the way it's going. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've often <laughs> thought in the last uh, few years, you know, oh my gosh, what would Marcus make of you know Donald Trump, or what would Marcus make of the re- the insurrection? You know, it's probably and, better uh, you I didn't just, see it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually think to myself, he would really, he'd probably tell me to calm down. <laughs> that, that's what he would probably do. He'd say, Don't, it's okay, Diane, it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it always seems to work out. <laughs> but in the moment, though, it yeah, seems horrible. he was horrible. very sanguine human, and I appreciated that. It was He was wise. Oh, so. <laughs> Yeah, his book, uh, Reading the Bible Again for the First Time, is one that I still, I just, I always have a copy on hand, but it's never the same copy because I keep giving it away. So, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so one of the things that you talk about also in this chapter um, is you, you talk about, um, you know, the Bible and and how we've kind of veered off the path and in, in, into this literalist kind of, uh, you know, we, we hear terms like inerrant, uh, and, uh, I laughed because you wrote about this, <laughs> this part where, uh, you recount, um, the Bible, literally, you know, God handing it down, uh, from heaven, you know, fully formed and written. And it's, and it blows my mind that we still not, we like, but a lot of people still believe that that is in fact the case when we have, access to information at our fingertips and you can see the kind of the, the slow, cause it obviously hundreds of years went into the writing of both the old Testament and new Testament. You can, you can see the evidence, you know, as it kind of came together and the selection process, like how, how is this still a thing? <laughs> uh, inerrancy? Yes. I have, I have no idea. <laughs> <sighs> you know what it does? It, it shows 
it, it shows how incredibly, I think, um, powerful the interpretive grids we are given by religious institutions can be. You know, if, if you grow up inside of a world that insists, you know, it keeps telling you over and over and over and over again that the Bible is the, you know, inerrant word of God and it was given in this particular method and, you know, Moses wrote the first five books of the, the Bible and on and on and on. Um, you know, all the authorities in your growing up life tell you that and it's very hard to move out of those kinds of things. But most people, or many people that are certainly in my circles, who did grow up in those kinds of um, churches or families, they they always had questions. You know, they always noticed that something was a little off with that. So, despite the the lenses they were given to look at scripture, um, you know, this is how this book was produced, and this is what this production means. Um, they still see. That something else is going on there. And, um, you know, it, it, after a while, if you get enough questions, it kind of cracks open y- your own spiritual or intellectual life. And you have to pursue those questions. And so, um, you know, I do tell the story about God dropping the Bible, the picture my brother drew, actually, of God <laughs> dropping the Bible on John West. It was John Wesley's head um, in the picture. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's. Um, I grew up mostly in mainline liberal Methodism, and that wasn't the primary view. I thought that the picture was funny and a little bit irreverent, but ultimately the world I grew up in uh, had a lot more flexibility than that. And so, you know, my my sense of scripture is that it, it's beautiful, it's amazing, it's profound. It's, I, I would say it does breathe the God um, and that it's, you know, it's the collection of these amazing experiences of the people of God over vast time and space. And because it is an experiential book, it possesses, all kinds of wisdom for how human beings should always live and um, is valued and treasured. And as people value and treasure a book, it actually, I think, gains a sense of authority. So, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that. You know, it's, it, it doesn't seem the, the views that I hold to scripture do not seem out of line at all. Um, with the tradition, and they're not in any way disrespectful. And I love reading the Bible, and I think the Bible is a remarkable collection of books that have benefited me and helped me see the world more clearly, even though they're, you know, thousands of years old. And so, um, so I'm grateful for that. And and it's it, see, it's so funny because uh, can you imagine if we were talking on like you know some other in some other circumstance? is people will know I'm politically liberal, I'm theologically liberal, you know, and yet what a testimony I just gave to scripture. And so the stereotype is that liberals don't don't believe in the Bible and liberals don't care about the Bible or right. liberals don't, you know, attend to the Bible. And that's just not true. It is not true at all. Um we attend to it and we care about it and we treasure it. And that we approach it in a different way that isn't just about sort of this literalism um, doesn't mean that we don't take it to heart in, in really important ways. So I, I, I get very, I get very irked. <laughs> so do <laughs> the I. The way people think that, the way that people think that liberal Christians talk about the Bible and the way liberal Christians actually talk about the Bible are two entirely different things. Oh, completely agree. I mean, I've, I've, I've heard before and been accused, well, you know, liberals or progressive Christians just don't take the Bible seriously. That's the one I hear a lot. And I, and I thought they they act as if we've just cast the Bible aside entirely when in fact, you know, we're digging just as deeply into it as anyone else. Uh, We just may not have the same, you know, view or be reading it through maybe perhaps the same lens uh, as, as this other person, but it doesn't mean that we're not taking it seriously. Yeah. And it's a really important part to think about when you are thinking about Jesus as rabbi, Jesus as teacher, because Jesus himself 
in his own time, he was working out of these ancient texts. You know, what was he teaching? He wasn't just teaching a whole bunch of stuff he made up. Um, although some Christians almost act that way. He was basically riffing on all these ancient texts of Israel. And so he's he's taking a body of scripture and he's interpreting it. And so that's what Jesus is teaching out of. Jesus is teaching out of those scriptures. And then, of course, what happens after much later, 100 years or so after Jesus has has been killed, is that you have the development of a Christian sacred literature that then takes the teaching of Jesus and starts interpreting it. You know, and so that's what's happening, of course, with with Paul, who's really the one of the first substantial interpreters of Jesus teachings in those those uh, epistles, you know, some of which appear 10, 15 years after um, Jesus was killed. Uh, they're very early documents that we have from Paul. And so we're getting Paul, who was formerly persecuting Jesus, interpreting Jesus' teachings, and Jesus was interpreting teachings of the Torah and the prophets. <laughs> so yeah. it's, a, it's a really interesting thing that's going on there. You know, it's, this is the multiple levels of interpretation and um, what Paul winds up writing does wind up being sacred scripture for Christians, um, which is fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating historical, like I think as, as well as anything else. So. Yeah. Oh my And gosh. then of course, in my field, uh, having a PhD in religious studies, there I have tons of colleagues who their whole life is dedicated to interpreting Paul or yeah, yeah, <laughs> what have you, you know. So we get these layers. It's, talk about poor Jesus needing to be freed. We get layers of interpretation on top of layers of interpretation. It's no wonder Jesus says, "Get me out of here," you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just breathe for a minute. You know, I'm running running through the streets of Washington D.C. I'd be happy out there. <laughs> So it reminds me of a new coffee mug I added to my collection recently that has a picture of Jesus on the front and says, Oh my God, you guys, that's not what I meant. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a perfect mug to go with my book. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> not what I meant. That's not what I meant. Uh, um, one of the things I, I, I definitely wanted to make sure that, that I, I got you to, to, uh, talk about is the section on, on Jesus as savior. And the fact that you mentioned that, uh, the reference to savior really only appears, uh, a couple times in the gospel. So, but, but it's so, Twice. yeah, but it's so, it's so heavy, heavily used and referenced in like specifically evangelical Christianity, you know, the savior and, and, um, you know, especially in reference to uh, the cross and atonement, you know, like Jesus had to die for the forgiveness of my sins. And I've been uh, told that that's the way that Christians have always viewed it since the beginning of time. Uh, what would you say to that? Well, it certainly is not the way that the gospel writers talk about it. And um, you know, the, the, primary text that talks about Savior is the birth text um, in Luke, where the angels say, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so, actually, that combines a couple of these titles, <laughs> Savior, Christ, Anointed One, Lord. Oh my gosh, we got three for one from the angels. And um, the that's the primary text in the in the Gospels. I think the other example is in Mark, at the end of Mark, and um, where it's used at the end of Mark, uh, if I if my memory serves me correctly, it's that isn't even in the original ending of Mark. It's in the secondary ending of Mark. Yeah, that was, that was put on later. <laughs> right, and so so apparently to the gospel writers who were telling their stories, in effect, the gospels are the gospel writers telling a story about them and Jesus. They're telling their interpret their interpretive experience of who Jesus is. And so you have from Mark, you know, this sort of immediate, very sort of teacherly Jesus um, who also, you know, heals people. And then there's the, you know, the, the passion narrative. And you get uh, 
Luke, you know, who's very concerned about issues of the poor and women and folks who are marginalized. You get Matthew, who's telling an experience of a very, very, very Jewish Jesus. And then you get John, the, the story of the, the sort of the, the mystical, poetic Jesus. And so, so you get these four portraits of Jesus, these four different pictures that are in the canonical Gospels, and that doesn't even count all the other ones that were running around in the ancient world, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, all those things. And so, um, but they're all accounts. They're all personal accounts of who this person, who, who this Jesus is. And it's really interesting because they all claim that personal, you know, thing is that, oh, this was written by Luke. This was written by Mark. This was written by Matthew. And so it's like the, the credibility of the, the whole story is based around the idea that some individual actually knew Jesus. And so it's kind of fascinating, you know, to think of these as um, memoir theology. That's what the Gospels are, memoir theology. And so if you go to them, this idea of Savior is not really present. Um, you get talk of Christ being the anointed one, or you get the idea, which is not quite Savior, that's the Messiah, and so you get this idea of Jesus being the the Messiah. And what's fascinating about that is, at least in a couple of places, uh, Jesus, like the Gospel of Mark, Jesus doesn't want anybody to know. <laughs> so he says, don't call me that. So we have this thing in the Gospels called the Messianic secret. Mm. And so, so, you know, don't use that, don't use that word in public don't that don't don't call me that and so even though there is this sort of open secret about the be, Jesus being the anointed one um the language of savior doesn't show up in that transactional die for our sins kind of way uh that will become part of the narrative that Paul tells later on so so it's pretty pretty surprising yeah, because I mean, like I said, I think salvation and and being because you even mentioned one of my favorite favorite phrases, which is um, you know when people ask you, "Are you saved?" You know, but and what they really mean is, "Are you you know did you give yourself did you did you say the special prayer that that is going to save you from being thrown into hell?" That's right. Uh, we, we're, our understanding of salvation is and who Jesus is is pretty simple and that is the idea we are terrible sinners from our birth and we do not deserve to ever come face to face with God and because we don't deserve being in God's presence we will forever find ourselves in hell and that God felt kind of sorry for us and so God sent God's son um, to die on a cross in our place, although we deserve to be the ones who would be cast forever into the pit of hell, uh, God sent God's Son to die, and in that action gave a sinless victim that would release us from our sins, and that if we accepted Jesus into our hearts, uh, we then would go to heaven and live with God forever. And that's the story of, a, of popular American Protestantism or the theology of pro popular American Protestantism and who Jesus is. But there's so much in the, in the Gospels that run counter to that story that it's kind of weird if you think about it. Um, one of the things I do point out in the, Sal the Savior chapter, which I actually loved writing because it reminded me why I liked being an evangelical when I was 15, and, <laughs> and, you know, when you're 15, uh, there is just something magical about sitting in the backyard around a campfire singing Pass It On yeah. and having all these sort of warm <laughs> feelings, uh, being with your friends and sort of expo exploring this biblical world of Jesus for the first time. And, and so it, the, this whole chapter gave me permission to feel myself being 15, that 15-year-old girl again, who just fell completely in love with Jesus. I mean, I was, I was transfixed by Jesus. And a, another... Uh, as sort of another century, my parents probably would have sent me off to the convent, you know. <laughs> I would have been friends with Teresa of Avila. You know? yeah. Oh, my God, look at that girl. She loves Jesus so much. We're going to send her to the convent. We don't know what to do with her. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that was the girl I was. And it was so fun to write about that. But, you know, when you read the Gospels, you know, 
when you get a little past being 15, is that there's this strange thing that happens, is that Jesus is saving people in the Gospels before he dies. And so it's like, well, wait a second. If it's Jesus' death on a cross that saves us, how is it? That the woman at the well, the paraplegic, <laughs> the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, yeah. the blind man at the at the well uh, at, at the at the temple, you know, it's like, wait a second, how are all how are all these people saved? And Jesus is just walking around being Jesus. Right. They're not saved by his death. They're saved by encountering Jesus and by trusting that somehow this rabbi with these extraordinary words about love it, who is forming this ragged community of of people at the the edges of roman society that somehow that is what heals them and the capacity of people who have no hope and who have been rejected by everyone in every way um, can reach out and touch the hem of this rabbi and believe that, that that touch is going to be the thing that restores their souls, that that gives them healing, salvus. Um, that, to me, is a much greater miracle and even mystery uh, than the idea of this, you know, sort of uh, tit for tat, quid pro quo, God who um, kills Jesus that we get off, uh, uh, we we get freed from prison uh, for heaven, and so how, what do you make of that? You know, was Jesus only a savior because he died? Not according to the Gospels. Jesus was saving the whole time, and um, that's a pretty theologically interesting can to open for some people. You know, I think that a lot of people will have never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I would consider myself one of those people. It wasn't until later on in my, probably my thirties. I thought that is kind of a weird problem solved there. You know, we talk about this all powerful God who can do anything. And yet that's the only solution God could come up with. It seems kind of absurd. It seems like a very small, limited God to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know yeah, it's a, it's okay. a, it is a strange thing, you know, to think yeah. God couldn't have thought of a better solution than sending God's <laughs> only only son into the world and killing that person. And so it's yeah. like, wait a second, there's something really strange about this. <laughs> and and of course, in that chapter, I do talk about those different kinds of atonement theories. And that's another place as we're ending up. But I do think it's important in the context of this conversation. Um the those theories about salvation called atonement theories um, really are all theories about how do we become, how do we as wounded, broken, sinful human beings, how do we become one in union with um, the presence of the all-compassionate God of the universe? How does that happen? And so... You know, people love solving mysteries. I mean, you can say, oh, it's a mystery, or you can try to solve it. You can kind of come up with a solution. And that's one of the things that I came to appreciate again about Paul. You know, it's it's so funny. You write a book about Jesus, and I wound up thinking about Paul all year. And um, I did not, this was my surprise in this chapter. Um, I did not realize how many options Paul gives for atonement theories within the epistles themselves. And um, one of the authors that I studied as I was working my way through these questions, a guy named Stephen Finlan, um, he, he thinks there are six different atonement theories that are operative in just Paul's epistles, and that Paul never really picks um, one over wow. the other, but Protestants seem to have picked the one that we're talking about called substitutionary atonement. Um, that, that we seem to have picked that one and said that's the only one. Whereas Paul himself, again, like he has a multitude of different images of Jesus, he has at least six different potential theological ideas about how that oneness of broken humanity and the, 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 the total love of God um, occurs uh, in relationship to 
Jesus. And so, so I thought that was kind of beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, I just mentioned that in the context of this. You know, don't, don't get stuck on one because Paul wasn't stuck on one. Paul has at least six. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. Um, one of the things I know, because I know we're running out of time, and, and of course I have um, a bundle more questions that we just don't have time to get to, but the one I wanted you to, to kind of uh, definitely speak to, because you, you address it in the book, and it's, one, it's a topic that is fascinating to me at least, uh, and one that we've never really covered, is just the, the concept of the Trinity. Like, the fact that, like, it, you look in the Bible and there is no reference to the Trinity in there. Um, how did you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, what in the world is spirit? Are we talking about ghosts? What are we talking about here? And then we've got the Father and the Son. Like, how did we assign genders? You know, like, how did all of this come to be? Well, well that was a theological puzzle to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, obviously it still is because anybody who says they completely can answer those questions, they're pulling your chain. And um, <laughs> the... It arises for me as I'm sitting in a class as a college student, and I went to a, a Christian college, and doctrine was a required course. And so we're sitting there, and the, the doctrine professor says, the doctrine of the Trinity is never explicitly found in the New Testament. And I remember, like, what? What did this man just say? You know, here's something you kind of assume when you're a 20-year-old, 21-year-old student. And uh, I just always thought it was there. And and, he, and then he goes on. And so it's like I, my pen. I've dropped my pen on the floor now. And um, this is when you used to take notes by pen. Right. And um, and so he, he went on and he said, um, yes, this doctrine was extrapolated by early Christians from various textual evidence and their own experience. And I, you could have, I mean, it was, this was like me being the Apostle Paul. I felt like the, the, the building had cracked open and that light was pouring through the ceiling. And I'm sitting there going, extrapolated? <laughs> <laughs> the doctrine that they insist that you believe over your baptism right. is extrapolated? Like, you know? wait a minute. <laughs> so, so um, you know, that's been a set of questions that's just always attended me. And, you know, the extrapolation that the early church made does actually make sense. Um, but it takes them three or hundred or so years to extrapolate it. It's not like they wake up one morning and say, oh, God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and Jesus has right. got two it, 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 two natures, fully human and fully divine. This did not happen from pointing to a particular, from proof texting from the New Testament. This happened because the early Christian communities were having fights. Um, they hated one another on these different scores and the different ways they were drawing up their experiences of Jesus. And they were trying to figure out, you know, how to develop some level of consensus in all of these conflicting experiential narratives that they have. And they, and then they took these narratives and they ran them up against Greek and Roman culture and said, well, okay, you know, we're also living in this world. And so how does it make sense here? So, so that's the process is that you have this incredible diversity of texts stories that people are telling in the ancient world about Jesus, that they're, they're claiming to be their own experience or the experience of somebody who told them about their experience. And, and they're, they're holding on to the Jewish roots of faith because they're still very close to that. And they're also living in Greek and Roman culture. And all of that comes into sort of like a stew. And then they say, well, given all of this, now we've got these really big questions about who God is and who Jesus is very particularly. And for the question about God is simple in certain ways. It really came out of Jewish monotheism. It's the early Christians found themselves in effect worshiping Jesus, which meant the early Christians were functionally worshiping two gods, God the Father, the Father of Jesus, and Jesus, the and Jesus himself. And that was problematic 
because most many of them were Jews. And so how can you be monotheist and worship two gods? And so so the question of the Trinity emerges out of that crucible. Um, and then the question of Jesus' nature, was Jesus human being or was Jesus God? And how do those two things relate to one another? That essentially becomes a question that emerges out of Greek and Roman philosophy about the nature of personhood. And... Um, those questions are huge and interesting, and they become the creeds. Uh, but, you know, I ask myself all the time, you know, when I say the creeds, they made sense within the context of Greek and Roman philosophy. But how? Do, what, what questions do I bear now about who God is and who Jesus is? And and how I understand Jesus as being a human being who lived 2,000 years ago, and how I understand Jesus as having some sort of unique and revelatory, um, uh, I don't want to say vocation necessarily, it, it, Jesus bore within Jesus' own self some sort of unique and re revelatory embodiment of God. And so, so the, the the creeds, while they're beautiful, I don't really have an issue with them. I'm happy enough to say them in church. The, the, the reason they make me stumble um, is not because I disbelieve them. It's because I feel far away from them. Hmm. And I remember how the creeds were shaped. And the creeds were shaped by questions of 15, 1800 years ago. And while I can still recite the, their answers, you know, as wise and poetic coming out of their experience, I'm asking different questions now. And that means, of course, that we have the freedom um, to write creeds anew in new situations when we're surrounded by new questions and things that are prompted uh, by the world in which we live uh, to re-examine these very basic kinds of ideas about the nature of God and how Jesus embodies that. And so, so I think it's, I think those are really interesting questions. So they, it was, it was strange and shocking though. When I, and then what I describe of, of as, as happening to me at 20, I re-describe it happening again to me when I was about 30 when I was in graduate school. And what those are, those are questions of what, you know, we call historical consciousness. And that is when the life of faith runs into um, how we understand history as 21st century people. And the two things are not speaking the same language <laughs> at all. <laughs> One of them is speaking a language of extrapolation from <laughs> culture and religious tradition. And the other one is speaking the language of, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's like, well, wait a second. Uh, which, one go, which one do I go with here? Right. <laughs> the, the, the testimony of these old, old, old creeds, which are beautiful and poetic, as I said, or that they were extrapolated historically and philosophically. And it's really important for people to know who are listening to this, that that lecture was at an evangelical Christian college. <laughs> it was at a safe place. And the professor who gave that lecture got a PhD at a Catholic university. So I was not sitting at like the University of Virginia with some secular heretic trying to take <laughs> the faith away from all of his students. I was sitting in the safest possible classroom in America learning about the doctrine of the Trinity. And that's what was taught. And it was like, oh, boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it is clearly someone who knew and was honest about the history uh, of how this yes how this came to came to be. Yeah, <laughs> he was a wonderful professor. He he actually uh, his name was Curtis Whiteman, and uh, he shows up a couple different times in the book. And because um, he was very influential uh, on me and my friends, and we used to joke we called him um, Kurt Whiteman. Because of, you know, Boltman and Moltman, we, we figured right. that he deserved that 
that accolade of the man rather than man whiteman <laughs> and so uh, it was it, it's interesting cuz he he had a stroke when he was really fairly mm-hmm. young man and never wound up having i think the either the teaching or the academic career that he might have otherwise had but he certainly as it shows up in these chapters um, you know, here's this generation of young students at an evangelical college, and it was, he taught us liberation theology. Wow. He taught a very critical course in American evangelicalism, um, and he taught doctrine, and he was brutally honest um, about the development of doctrine. And so I think that an incredible amount of my capacity to question and it goes back to those classrooms, and uh, a, a man who gave a lot, um, and then had a a, a, a difficult um, older um, adulthood. And I think he's still alive, but you know, he he. I think the stroke happened when he was he was he maybe not even fifty five. I mean, he's still oh, really. Wow. I mean, really, really pretty young. It is, it is amazing. Maybe before he was fifty, actually. Oh, that's so young. It, it is remarkable, though, how um, there are these uh, professors or these these teachers out there who are doing this wonderful work and and aren't necessarily getting, as you said, the accolades of some of these other uh, names out there. And, you know, I had a professor. Uh, I went to a, a small liberal arts college that was uh, associated with the um, ELCA Lutheran Church. And one of my, if not my favorite professor, one of my favorite professors, and I just had him for one religion class, was uh, Dr. E. Ray Bryant. And uh, my first exposure to to other thinkers like Joseph Campbell and, and mythology and all these different things, and really just kind of gave me permission to kind of go outside of the kind of very narrow kind of view that I had up until that point. Yeah, and that goes in some ways goes back to that teacher chapter. Um, is that best teachers are teachers who come alongside of us and they're teaching us a whole bunch of information that we're learning about, you know, the development of the creeds or what have you. Uh, But then, you know, they, they turn the page on that, on what you thought before, you know, they tell the story in such a way, you know, that you can never see it again without hearing the word extrapolation you know, right. in your in your mind, and so you know there's that's that's wisdom that becomes that becomes wisdom. That's the sage. That's the teacher who instructs and sets you free. You know, sets you free to be on your own path. And that's the kind of teacher Jesus was too. Instructed yeah. people and set them free. Ah. So good. Uh, I, I, people go out and get the new book. It's called Freeing Jesus, Rediscovering Jesus as Friend, Teacher, Savior, Lord, Way, and Presence. Uh, it's out now. It's one of my favorite books I've read this year easily. Um, it's I think it's your best work, honestly. I, I think it's terrific. So uh, thank you so much for, for coming out again. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, I'm, del- I'm delighted. And it's... um. I, I'm really glad to hear you say that because it's it's a it's 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 an easy to read book that's deceptively simple, but people learn theology. People will see how to write spiritual memoir. They'll learn a whole bunch about the the sort of Christianity we live with in America today. And uh, at the end, I don't want to give too much away, <laughs> but I think that um, the last chapters give a kind of a whisper of promises for how we can heal the divides that we have and how Christianity can really speak um, lovingly and powerfully uh, towards justice and towards uh, a diverse and pluralistic society. So, so I loved writing it and I'm just so pleased that you liked it because, hey, uh, deconstructionist opinion matter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only wish that were true, but thank you anyway. <laughs> oh man. Well, Oh my gosh. I thank you, it. John. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. We always have a good time when you come on. So, uh, thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Company line was the only way to get Church uncertainty that fears everything against it. Where the refugee suffers and the white man has it made. I won't do it anymore. It's taken me. Hi!
the sick and poor and try to help the world to recover. I sat myself in your pews every single week, and I gave you my money. Tell me what to think And I learned from a book That you had taken the heart out of And that's how I learned To make exclusion Taking me too long to recover I'll go feed the sick and poor And try to help the world to recover So come, come as you are Take up your cross Use it to build a wall And reach across the aisle And fire your guns So you can keep them And love, love how you want If we approve And you'll be undefiled So come Accept our gift, salvation from sinners. I won't do it anymore. It's taken me too long to recover. I go feed the sick and poor and try to help. Take a while to wade through the fear and the hurt. But I think there's a way for us to love and heal the world. Find what brings you joy this holiday season with Best Buy. Welcome guests to a sparkling home thanks to your new robot vacuum. Or enjoy a cozy holiday movie night on a new flat screen TV. Shop BestBuy.com and get free next day delivery on thousands of items.